All right, this video is to discuss the organism Legionella pneumophila. Um, this is the causative agent of Legionnaire's disease, um, which some of you may have heard of. It's also the causative agent of Pontiac fever. So we'll differentiate between the two syndromes that um, this organism causes toward the end of the video. This organism was actually first identified in the summer of 1976. Um, and the reason was because several legionnaires were actually died um, in Philadelphia as a result. And this organism was kind of identified from those patients. And then um, the syndrome that it causes was coined legionnaires disease after the legionnaires that had died. So identifying it, it's a gram negative pleomorphic rod. So what does that mean? Um, it can kind of take on different shapes depending on where you're looking at it. It can look like kind of short rods like you're seeing here to kind of elongated rods. You can see that it clumps together well, but you also have a couple that are kind of in chains. Um, in tissue, it actually tends to look more like a coxobacillus. Um, so kind of short, almost a rounded shape. So we can't really um, make a distinction just based on its morphology. It also has kind of an odd staining pattern, as you can see here. It is a gram negative organism, but that's kind of a poor definition for it because the gram stain doesn't really work very nicely um, with this particular organism. Instead, you're gonna wanna use silver stain. Silver stain is something that's actually normally used for staining um, fungal organisms that cause infection, but it actually works quite nicely for um, El pneumophila as well. Biochemically, it's an oxidase positive organism. So that's another just kind of differentiating um, factor that you can use for identifying it once you've um, subcultured it. Culturing it is um, somewhat difficult. It's a very fastidious organism. It actually requires a um, specialized media for broth that is buffered with L-cysteine, charcoal, and iron. So if you're gonna grow it in culture anyway, it's got kind of really specific requirements. It's also an obligate aerobe. Um, this means that obviously it needs oxygen in order to survive. Um, if you take a patient sample and go to culture this one, you're going to want to inoculate it onto that BCYE media pretty quickly. I've seen it in some places like up to date and Murray's um, that some places will do kind of a, um, a uh, bedside inoculation, or at least it's recommended, but that's almost never done. So just try to get it into media as soon as you possibly can. Um, somewhat interestingly, even though it's an obligate aerobe, it's actually a facultative intracellular pathogen. Um, so it needs to use up our oxygen supplies within our cells in order to replicate, because it does replicate within our cells. In nature, these guys are actually able to multiply quite happily inside a wide variety of amoeba. Um, but in our bodies, they actually prefer alveolar macrophages and monocytes as well as epithelial cells, you know, sites of really nice oxygen rich environments. Um, and unsurprisingly, since it spends time in amoeba when it's not attacking us, it's also found in water so sources. Um, it has a nearly worldwide distribution near natural bodies of waters, such as lakes and streams, and that's where it can sometimes be found and part of where we encounter it. So let's go a little bit more in depth on all of this. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's a uh, intracellular, facultative intracellular pathogen. Um, it multiplies inside our monocytes, macrophages, and epithelial cells. So you can see here that, let's say this is one of our alveolar macrophages. Um, it gets picked up by phagocytosis. Um, it does this using um, the complement receptor, so CR3. Um, we haven't really talked too much about complement yet. We will actually a lot in the very next case. But um, basically, what happens is it binds to one of the receptors for these proteins on a phagocyte surface, and then it penetrates through using either phagocytosis or endocytosis with that receptor. And unlike most organisms that get phagocytosed by a phagocyte, it's not going to be easily killed. So the bacteria aren't killed by um, exposure to toxic superoxides or hydrogen peroxide or hydroxyl radicals like we talked about in the Listeria case. Much like the um, Listeria monocytogenes organism, it actually inhibits phagolysosome fusion. So it actually inhibits 
this acidification of the lysosome that's meant to break down the organism. So instead, it winds up multiplying inside um, this vacuole that it creates. And then once it's um, multiplied enough, it kind of ruptures out of the vacuole, and then it's able to lyse the host cell and escape to go on and infect another cell. Um, so one of the things with this is that as it ruptures this host cell, that's a pretty inflammatory event within the microenvironment of your lungs. We don't like to see lysed alveolar macrophages. So that's really um, inflammatory and that causes a huge chemokine and cytokine reaction, which is going to increase um, inflammation to the site. And that's kind of characteristic of an infection with Legionella. Um, so that part actually could have um, some effect on kind of humoral responses, but really when we're thinking about Legionella, because it has this whole growth cycle that occurs actually inside the cell, we're really worried about cell-mediated immunity. So cell-mediated immunity is really important for fighting off this infection because of its intracellular um, period that it spends replicating, whereas the humoral response is really only going to play a role once it lyses out. And because the cell-mediated immune response is so important, so is interferon gamma. Because remember, interferon gamma is going to basically stimulate macrophages to be better at killing ingested microbes. Um, and it also helps stimulate um, T cells as well. It works with them. So that's going to really bolster that cell-mediated immune response. So is this one of those infections that I tell you about that you'll never actually see? No. But will you see it often? No. Um, this is one that does crop up from time to time. And when it does crop up, it kind of comes with these focal outbreaks. Um, per year, there's about 5,000 cases um, that are um, documented, that are actually diagnosed of Legionella in the US. Um, and that's been since about the year 2000, we see about 4,000 cases a year. Um, and these are only the ones that are diagnosed. Why? Well, because there is a self-limited form of Legionnaires that you probably wouldn't see because a person would just clear it. So we're really only seeing Legionnaires where um, a patient maybe lacks some cell-mediated immunity and therefore they're getting severe enough that they're seeking out care. But you can see here on just kind of a quick search, here are outbreaks that have happened with Legionella in the last three months. So um, a woman died on, uh, let's see, it's Friday today. So a woman died, you know, on Wednesday of um, a Legionnaire's outbreak in the Ludlow Hotel in England. Um, this particular outbreak, nine people got sick, one woman died. And you could think like, ah, but that's England and stuff is old there. Maybe their water supply isn't great. But actually New York steadily every year seems to have a couple cases that crop up. Um, this year, there's two cases reported at an apartment complex in Queens. Um, one has been killed and sick have, six have been made sick in the Upper East Side of New York. Um, so that's pretty um, regular. Um, not even the King's House is safe. A woman, 62, died um, after contracting Legionella at the Graceland Hotel. And it was actually linked to breathing problems that occurred in Flint, Michigan in 2014 and 2015. The largest outbreak year was 2011. Um, New York had an outbreak um, during one month where 70 people were sick and something like 15% of those people actually died of Legionnaire's disease. So it is something that crops up and like I said, kind of in these um, foci. So why does it happen in these foci? Because person to person transfer doesn't happen. It's not like I get it and then I cough and then you get it. No, we all have to get it because we're near the same water source. So Legionella causes a biofilm. And a biofilm is actually, I like this picture because it's kind of a good, in my mind, um, caricature of what it is. It's just bacteria that are growing in kind of a sheet form so that they cling to things really easily. Um, so the organism is able to survive in a moist environment for a really long time, and it's got kind of a high uh, resistance, so it can survive at high temps, um, and it can even survive things like chlorine. Um, so it's pretty difficult to kill. 
And because of that, that means that you've got kind of options for where this could be. So that means things like pools and spas, they're really good candidates for this. Um, fish aquariums, certainly those. Um, but where people tend to kind of get in trouble are two places. Hospital water supplies have been linked here a couple of times. And the big baddie of all of these is air conditioners. So these air conditioner cooling towers. Um, so if we look back at this slide, um, look at the months when this happened. So um, I'm searching this on September 15th. So we've got a couple from September 11th and September 13th, but we also have ones from June. Um, and each of these are kind of retrospective from things that happened in June, July, and August. They're happening in the summer. They're happening during warm months and they're often happening when people kick on the air conditioning. So the air conditioner was turned on again for the first time. So if you look at New York, part of the reason they have trouble is that on these large apartment buildings, they have these large air conditioning cooling towers. And that outbreak I talked about where they had 70 people within an apartment building get sick, it was one of these air cooling towers that was kind of contaminated with this Legionella and then you turn the air conditioner on and just like that you have aerosolized Legionella and we just inhale it and now it gets to go to its happy place which are your alveolar macrophages and monocytes and then it's able to begin replicating no problem. So it's exactly where it wants to be so we're kind of set up perfectly for this. So where do we expect to find if you're going to find Elnumophila? So um, we already talked about um, air conditioners and cooling towers. With air conditioners, more a concern with like wall units that aren't well maintained over the winter. Um, you know, if you just like throw a tarp over them and stick them in the basement, some of that condensation builds up. Legionella could build there. Um, tap water faucets. Um, an alarming amount of hospitals can actually isolate Elnumophila from their from their tap water faucets um, and other I don't want to just blame hospitals it's you know other um, places with kind of old plumbing you're more likely to find it respiratory therapy equipment so this is kind of a concern because respiratory therapy equipment has to be kept somewhat humid somewhat moist um, patients are breathing in and out that air obviously um, to get treatment and many of the time much of the time when we're using respiratory therapy equipment one of the things that we are giving patients using respiratory therapy equipment are glucocorticoids. We're giving them steroids. Um, and if you're giving a patient, um, if you're giving a patient glucocorticoids, you're also potentially decreasing their cell mediated immunity. And so you've got an apparatus that is prone to contamination with L. pneumophila, and then you're giving them a therapy that reduces their ability to fight off L. pneumophila. So it's certainly a concern to make sure that respiratory therapy equipment is always well maintained. Likewise, humidifiers, those can get gross pretty quickly, so make sure you're keeping them clean. And then kind of just simple things, whirlpools, pools, spas, hot tubs, whatever you want to call them, and showers. All these places where water hangs out, that's another good place for El Pneumophila to hang out. Okay, so what does El Pneumophila cause? Um, there's kind of two syndromes associated with it. The first is Pontiac fever, and the second one is Legionnaire's disease. Pontiac fever is basically the, um, the easygoing version, if you want to call it that, of Legionella infection. This is just a self-limited flu-like illness. Patients will have fever, chills, myalgia, malaise, and a headache, but no clinical evidence of pneumonia. There's no pneumonia associated with Pontiac fever. Um, it's self-limited. It'll last two to five days. You don't typically have to treat the patient. Um, there's really no mortality or morbidity associated with it. Just you feel kind of bad for about two to five days and then you get better. And that's part of the reason why I say that um, there are potentially more Legionella infections than we're aware of. Because if you have a flu-like illness for two to five days and you go to your doctor and say, yeah, you know, I'm coughing a bit, I feel bad, I have a headache, I have a fever, they're going to go, that eh, could be a viral infection. Let me know if you start to get much worse, then we can culture or whatever. And you know, you get better. So it could be that it's being mistaken. Legionnaire's disease, though, you're not going to mistake. Um, this is a severe pneumonia, um, much more severe than Pontiac fever. Um, if untreated, it can cause considerable morbidity, um, up to 15% morbidity and mortality rate in previously healthy individuals, and that can skyrocket up to 75% 
if we look at immunocompromised individuals. So your HIV AIDS population, your transplant patients, um, patients on glucocorticosteroids, um, cancer patients, and again, the elderly. Um, so in fact, during most outbreaks, 90% of Legionnaire's disease cases occur in patients over the age of 40. When you think 40, well, at least I think 40 and go, oh man, that's not that old. Um, maybe you guys still think it's really old, but I don't think it's all that old. Um, but then we normally think of decreasing cell mediated immunity over the age about, of about 60, but we actually see an increased risk for this one over the age of 40 um, for contracting um, Legionnaires. Um, so in this case, you're going to have about a two to 10 day incubation period before the symptoms start. Then you get systemic symptoms that are similar to like the acute illness that we discussed with Pontiac, um, fever, chills, but you also get this dry, non-productive cough and a headache. And this can progress to a multi-organ disease that involves the gastrointestinal tract, central nervous system, liver, and kidneys. Um, the primary location though is the lungs and it's associated with this multi-lobar consolidated pneumonia that has that mass inflammation. Because remember, this is a pretty inflammatory syndrome. And it's associated also with these micro abscesses in the lung tissue. <clears throat> okay, so how do we diagnose it? So culture on BCYE agar is the gold standard. So remember, that's the buffered L-cysteine um, iron-enriched uh, agar. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you can do that, but um, you're not really going to be able to gram, style this, gram stain this one um, because, remember, it doesn't gram stain well. So that means it's pretty rarely seen in clinical specimens. So um, that makes subculture even more important, making sure that you can actually grow it out. Um, in the meantime, there is actually a urine antigen test. Um, so urine antigen test is a specific lipopolysaccharide urine antigen. Um, and it's an immunoassay that's used to identify Legionella in the urine of infected patients. It's pretty sensitive, um, up to 90% se uh, sensitivity. Um, and the only drawback is that there are other serogroups of Legionella species, and it really only um, works for serogroup one. So if you're infected with a different serogroup, it will become negative. The other thing is that the antigen actually persists in the urine of treated patients. So um, if you've treated a patient, you can't then do a urine test to see if they've cleared the infection because the antigen will stay for a while. 50% um, of patients will remain positive at one month and 25% two months. So uh, you're really going to need to watch that. And this persistence of the antigen is actually um, more likely to occur uh, in patients that are immunosuppressed. So in uh, immunosuppressed patients, you're probably looking at at least a year um, of being able to detect the antigen in the urine. Okay, so there is also PCR. You could technically run PCR um, from respiratory secretions. Um, and it's a highly specific and sensitive method for detection that is used in a lot of different diseases. In this one, it is somewhat problematic. There do seem to be a lot of false negatives common. Um, so if you suspect it, even if it's a negative, go ahead and subculture that and see, you know, are you looking at an oxidase positive silver stain organism? Um, and obviously do your urine test, but that could be a way to go if you don't have serogroup one. Treatment with this one is pretty tricky, and we're actually going to spend a lot of time um, talking about different treatment mechanisms for organisms um, over the course of the host defense host response block. But basically, we're looking at macrolides, um, azithromycin, clarithromycin, those are an option. Fluoroquinolones tend to be kind of a preferred option for this one, specifically levofloxacin. Um, Beta-lactams you're going to avoid. You can't really use them. Um, there are high amounts of beta-lactamases um, present in the cell wall of L. pneumophila, so that kind of makes it um, ineffective against these particular organisms. And that's it.